In another two days, the 10th National Assembly will be inaugurated by the President in conformity with the requirements of the Constitution and as the aspirants for the principal offices of the two chambers of the legislative body perfect their strategies for the election. Many Nigerians are anxious as to whether it's going to be business as usual when the lawmakers eventually settle down to do the business for which they were chosen by their constituents. The outgoing session of the National Assembly is getting a lot of stake for being unusually close to the executive and failure to keep the outgoing president on his toes. What does Tuesday's elections hold for the opposition caucuses in both the Senate and House of Representatives? For a conversation, we have now been joined from Marais Abuja Studios by Honorable Sergius Ogun, a member of the House of Representatives representing Essan Northeast and Southeast Federal Constituency of Edo State. Good morning, Honorable. Good to see you. And good, good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you indeed, Honorable Ogun. Okay, let's dive into it. Um, give us a peep into the expectations for Tuesday uh, when the Tent Assembly uh, will come on stream. And of course, uh, a core component of that will be the uh, election of the principal officers. There's, there's been a lot of politicking, uh, different names, zonings, uh, been put forward as to those that the ruling party in particular uh, would prefer as the principal officers uh, of both houses. Give us a, a peep into what is likely to happen and why do you think that uh, what you're thinking uh, will be what Nigerians will get to encounter on Tuesday? Yeah, well, I, I think the... We, I don't think we have handled this well. Uh, I've said it in, in different places. We, I think they have uh, concentrated too much on zoning and on individuals. You know, I mean, talking about the ruling party, instead of talking about uh, the capacity of the individuals to do the job, considering where we are today as a nation. Uh, for the first time, uh, the APC sent out... Uh, on their headed paper, names of individuals, you know, and talking about zoning to their, to their zones and their, their states and then to the individuals. And some of us have uh, a problem with that. We would have thought that uh, for every member of the House of Rep or the Senate uh, matured enough to come there and make a decision, even though I know that the party usually will influence that decision. But well ahead of time, they did this. And I have, an, as an individual, I have an issue with that. But having also said that, I, I know the importance of having the number, four, number three citizen, who is the Senate President and Chairman of the National Assembly, and number four citizen, the Speaker. I know the importance of having such people on the side of the executive. So they will not just allow members to go in there and elect whoever they want to elect because knowing that that can be a big issue. So it's understandable that they have to meddle into the affairs of the members elect leading to these elections. But as in 2015, we saw an upset. And again, that was because uh, the then president was not ready to, to meddle into the affairs. And that produced uh, the Dogara, Saraki Dogara. And in fairness to that team, they were very fair to the executive, you know, till I think it became a case of uh, the executive just were treating them like poster boys. You know, we want this thing done, go and prove it. We want this done, you know, assent to it, or rather sign up on it and all. So that's when they pulled back and said, wait a minute. This house, the National Assembly should serve as a check to the executive, so we cannot be your errand boys. And that was when the issues that played out eventually, you know, came to the fore. So, but in, in the Ninth Assembly, of course, we also are aware how the president then, President Buhari, had a series of meetings with the APC members, you know, campaigning for Ahmed and uh, Senator Ahmed Lawa and uh, Femi Gwajabi Amila, and how that worked. You know, fortunately, we had, um, we had, uh, we were nicknamed uh, Robert Stamp House. 
And I think the executive really don't mind that. They don't mind having the rubber stamp house or National Assembly as long as they have their way. And I see that happening right now. Because the opposition that have, should have put up a fight are, are basically nowhere. Because the, really now the PDP is talking about the members need to take a stand, you know. But that's too late. It's coming too late. Because the individual members have been approached by the, by the APC, the ruling party, and those are out there, Abbas Kalu, have made promises to these individuals, concerning committees and all. And if you know, the spokesperson of Abbas Kalu is a PDP member, um, Barista Ogochinyere. So how are you going to unravel all this? How are you going to dismantle what has been neatly put together by, by, by the APC? So I don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday, but... Well, in another couple of, um, it's just one night, tonight and tomorrow, and then uh, we'll be there. But I can tell you the meetings are going up bumper to bumper. And uh, hopefully by, by Tuesday evening, the verdict will be out there for Nigerians. Definitely. Two more uh, nights and then we'll be able to find out exactly who is taking these positions. But I want to know what your take is on the just for the leadership position for the Senate presidency. Is religion a factor? Presently, the president and the vice president of Nigeria are Muslims. And the anointed candidates of the um, ruling AP, uh, All Progressives Congress for the speaker seat, uh, speakership seat, Abbas Tajuddin, is also a Muslim from Kaduna State. By this calculation, now... Uh, Senator uh, Yari contesting for the Senate presidency also now means that Muslims will hold all four significant positions in a, con in a country and a secular state uh, like Nigeria. So how important is, you know, religion as a factor? You've spoken about capacity, but on the, you know, on the flip side, what about religion? How important is it uh, that this itself is a, a, a standard or, or, you know, a factor that has to be considered in selecting who is going to become the Senate president? Yeah, ordinarily that should be an issue because, like you rightly said, and the fact is that Nigeria is a secular state. The, you cannot have the president a Muslim, the vice president a Muslim, and then the number three. Because if the court rules today and void the election of the president and the vice president, the number three citizen, the Senate president becomes the president. So people have complained about having the president and vice president you know, belonging to the same fate. Now that is an issue. You know, so if you now have the Senate president and speaker of the house being Muslims, I think that is, would be a very dangerous precedent for this country. People say religion really doesn't matter. It does. I'll give you an example. In the Ninth Assembly, the, the speaker of the house, uh, Femi Wajabia Miller, as we all know, is a Muslim. The deputy, uh, Honorable Idris um, Ahmed Wase, is a Muslim. And that was once they went for Hajj. And they had their official delegates, who were our colleagues. Official delegates means that, you know, you have to cater for them. You know, I mean, if you have people in your entourage, you have to pay for them. So our colleagues that were Muslims, that were in the entourage, to the Hajj, I mean, got accommodation and tickets were paid for them from the resources of the national of the House of Reps. I could not have been on that list because I'm a Christian. So, is that not even for 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 the sake of saying this? Is that not cheating that you're using the resources of the House for a class of people? Nobody ever said, okay, for this reason, let's also sponsor Christians to to Jerusalem. Even though I'm totally against using state resources for, for Hajj or pilgrimage, you know? And then there were posters being sent, there were pictures that were being sent to our forum. And one of the actors today in the speakership uh, race said, wow, you know, he's a Christian. Wow, I just love your religion. Everybody mixes together as one, you know, there's, you know, there's no difference between anybody. That is an adult that's above 50. So you can imagine if he was a teenager, that person is likely to be lured to become, to go to that fate. Those are the things people don't see. It becomes very dangerous. That's one. 
And two, if there are serious issues of national importance, the citizen number one, citizen two, three, four, are going to meet and take decisions. You can say, okay, well, maybe the president's wife is a, is a Christian. Is she going to be in that meeting? Is it not what the president discusses with her when he gets back home that she will know? If the president is too tired to even say anything, how will she know what's been discussed? Was she elected? Is she a member of a federal executive council? So I, I think it's a dangerous precedent that will be set if that happens. But that may be concerned about the Senate. That, yeah, as much as they are, they are propped up as Senator Akbabio, uh, I'm just a bit concerned that it might go to Yari. And if that happens, it will be one, two, three Muslims. And of course, the House already, whoever emerges in the House is definitely going to be a Muslim. However, whether it's the, from the G7 to G2 now, that might be G1 later tonight, or is the Abbas Kalu, whoever emerges as speaker definitely is going to be a Muslim. And as you know, the House, the Senate finishes their voting, whoever emerges, straight to the, speak, the, the clerk of the National Assembly comes, moves over to the House of Rep. So you don't have enough time to say, let's begin to tweak things around. So it will happen. But like I said, it's going to be a very dangerous precedent, and I don't think it should be allowed to happen. All right, Honorable Ogun. How, how do you think that uh, the outcome of the Senate uh, leadership election uh, might directly affect uh, that of the um, House of Representatives, given what you have just said, that at the moment uh, uh, it's over at the Senate, uh, the clerk moves to the House of Assembly? Uh, that's one part. The second part is... Uh, you have made uh, 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 references to issues of inducement um, at the list of those on the Hajj list, uh, the, the, the issue of the promises of our committees, juicy committees for members. Some other people are even saying uh, that on Tuesday, uh, it looks like uh, a few other things might even have been promised uh, to determine how people vote. Do you think that this is healthy? Do you think that this will have a, a role to play in who becomes uh, either the speaker uh, or even the Senate president and then who, you know, all the other important uh, principal officers? How much is this inducement a threat for the 10th National Assembly uh, that will birth on Tuesday? Okay, well, let me start with uh, the first question, which is the the effect of the, the aftermath of the election of the, in, the, in the Senate, it does really affect the House. Uh, if you cast your mind back to 2015, when the, uh, the senators and House of, uh, senator elects and House of Rep elects, members went to ICC, International Conference Center, where they were supposed to meet with the president then, President Buhari, who just came back from a foreign trip. Then the, pre the president today, Asiwaju, uh, Ahmed Tinubu, and the APC leaders were in ICC meeting with the senator elect and the House of Rep elect members to give them the last instruction on how they are going to vote. Then Saraki and some few APC members and PDP members were in the Senate. When it got to the time given for that election, the clerk of the House went ahead and conducted the election. So before they heard in ICC what was happening, the election was over. Saraki had won. And that information filtered into the House. So before the House members rushed back, and then we started the one in the House. And that affected the beliefs of those that were on the fence that Dogara could win. You know? And that's how Dogara won. Because it was almost... Uh, Basically the same pattern. Saraki and Co were against swimming against the tide. They were not the nominees of the party, so to speak, or the leadership of the party. Same thing with Dogara in the house. So when Saraki clinched it, it became obvious that Sar uh, Dogara was going to get it in the house, and that was what happened. Dogara got it. So it does have there's a correlation, it does have um, it does affect the election in the house. They're talking about inducement, it's always there. 
It's always there. We, we can't say too much about that. I, I have participated in two, and nobody has ever given me a dime. Yeah, money was offered to people, but nobody ever approached me because I came to the house, you know, as a very matured person. So how much are you going to give me to get me to vote for a colleague of mine? You know, so that was never an issue. And even in the last assembly, and I was told that uh, they had a list, the APC had a list, you know, and uh, the dense speaker, when they, when they go from number one to the last, when they get to my name, they would tell them, those working in the secretary, I just jumped the name. And they did that for some people that they knew had taken their stand and were not going to be able to change. So by saying this, I also want to tell us going forward, maybe we should elect very matured people to the, the House of Rep and the Senate. Because what happens there is very serious business. We do serious business there. So if somebody have, we have to come from his, yeah, I know you have been through an election. You have spent a whole lot of money. But that is behind you. You have the work to do. From when they are inaugurated on Tuesday, within a week, some of the allowances and all that will be paid, even the loans given for furniture, for rent, and for car will be released. So you can begin to recoup and pay back if you took any loan going into the elections. But yes, inducement plays a huge role. As on record that uh, those that voted for the, for the then speaker of this night assembly were given a card, and when you vote, you're supposed to snap that card, and that $10,000 was given to them. And I'm also aware that PDP then gave about $5,000, even to some of their members, you know? But you're, of course, you, we were in the saying, PDP leadership then. We, saying, we were told to contribute money, which we did. Honorable Ogo, you're but saying this it's authoritatively. A, it's very cheap. You're saying this authoritatively? Yeah, how? I was involved, so, <laughs> so what else uh, can it be? It's not the case of ESA. Yeah, because there was a gentleman sitting by me who is still coming back to the house. Who was, but he was the first time who was asking me, uh, PDP gave $5,000. Well, the other guys had given them $10,000. Why did PDP not up it to $10,000? So I asked him in the first case, should your party be giving you money to give you direction on how to vote? You know, so, yeah. But even though most of them would deny it, but like I said, I'm aware that happened. And the cards were available. They were given a plastic card with numbers, you know? So that's to confirm that, yes, for the money you have collected, you have voted. So, but like I said, mature people would do that. Well, not mature in age, but in mind and all that, and exposure, you know? Then the inducement of the committee is also there. Because in fairness, elections have become so expensive in Nigeria that you not just come to Abuja to speak English, to talk about bills and motions. You ought to take things to your constituency, projects. That's what the average constituent relates with. Not that you're on television every day debating one bill or one motion. And it's when you are in those big juicy committees, you're able to get those projects and maybe some cash in your pocket, you know? So we have to sit down as a nation and begin to review some of these things. We can sit here and accuse National Assembly members for all we care. But the reality in the constituent or in the constituency is that you must come with a, with a bag full of money before they will listen to you. You know, so these are issues that as a nation, if we want things to change, we must discuss them. Because you are, they, I mean, we accuse the National Assembly members of harassing the the MDAs, the ministries, departments, and agency, you know? Where in the first case, if those ones will do the right things, nobody will harass them. But even in the event that they don't do the right thing, it should not, it should not be extorting them. But these things will happen as long as those pressures are coming from the constituency. Because every member wants to return, wants to win an election. When you lose an election, you are seen as a failure. You know, we must begin to speak to these issues. Okay, Honorable Ogo, you know, there have been allegations that the race to the Senate president has been a fit of financial indu inducement. And based off of what you're saying, there is the possibility that the highest uh, spender might be the one that is set 
to win. Isn't this something that concerns you? And then also, I want to find out, with less than two days to the election of principal officers in National Assembly, it's starting to look like Senator Godwill, Godswill Akpabio's past has begun to haunt him. There are reports that uh, some senators elect in the APC have begun to back out from his camp due to his old feud with the Senate as a serving minister. How do you think uh, Akpabio's past with the Senate reincarnates uh, will affect his chances on Tuesday? Uh, sorry, the senators elect will affect his chances on Tuesday. Yeah, well, I, I know so many people have taken a stand against him. Maybe not so much of what he did as a minister, but because some people just feel it should come to the north. Because I've even heard one of the leaders, I think uh, Ahmed Baba, the spokesperson of Northern Elders, talking about why should uh, the top positions in the country go to the south. He mentioned the president. He said the vice president is, is attached to the office of the president. They talked about the, uh, the Senate president and then the chief justice of Nigeria. Why should they all be in the south? Of course, after he forgot quickly, that happened under Buhari also. But some people are of that view. That is why they are, they are projecting Yari, and Yari is very adamant that he's not going to step down. And I've seen some of the people with him, you know, they have taken the stand that they're, never, they're not going to step down. Yeah, talking about, well, again, for some of these people, it's not everyone that can be induced. I just made mention of myself and some other people that the party has said this is what should happen. And we follow the directive of the party. And there are so many people like that in the Senate. There's no amount of money you will give them that will make them bend because of their beliefs. I'll give you an example. If somebody has promised the committee uh, on NDDC, to, make, to be made the chairman of the uh, committee on NDDC, you don't need to give such a person money. He will go and look for money to support his candidate for the Senate, for this, uh, Senate president. Or somebody is going to be made the chairman of appropriation. If you are offered that, you don't need to be giving money. You will be the one to go and look for money to support your candidate to win. So there are other people without any inducement. They have a belief in an individual. Beside what the party says, they will just follow. So just to correct the impression, it's not everybody that can be induced. Then, talking about Aquabio's past, I, I dare say people have said the president is a... Is a senator, yeah, a senator, once a senator, the senator was a senator, then um, the vice president, they talk about the president's wife, again, I say that she's not an elected person. Then um, now you have the, the, the SGF, you know, that has served in the Senate, that with this, and then the chief of uh, staff to the president, being the, 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 the former speaker of the Ninth Assembly, that that is going to benefit the National Assembly. I not, I'm not going to be in a hurry. I will not be quick to say it might even disadvantage the National Assembly. But we have always seen ministers from the National Assembly work against the National Assembly. And the simple reason is because they know the workings of the National Assembly. If you begin to write to threaten a minister, because the minister doesn't know the in and out of how we operate in the National Assembly. The person can, can be harassed to either making an appearance or obeying certain summons. But for somebody that has been there, that has done similar things, that knows the limit of what you can do, we'll call your bluff. We have seen that again and again. You know, head of agencies that led the National Assembly to go and serve in the executive. They are the first to turn down any summon or invitation from the National Assembly. So uh, I was not just a Pabio alone. It happened even in the days of Senator Dagash and all that. You know, that was a guy that was uh, the head of um, one of the maritime agencies. You know, he was always fighting with the chairman of the committee because he was a member of the House of Reps. So it's something that happens naturally when people from the parliament goes to serve in the in the executive. They don't give a whole lot of respect to, to mm -hmm. the parliament. And I just pray that doesn't happen. I see some of my colleagues are excited about that, but I think that excitement might be short-lived because there, there is going to be a real fight. But we, again, which is good. 
It's good for democracy. When some of those fights happen between the parliament and the executive. Because if the romance is too much, they will throw, throw the voters, throw the electorates under the bus. So uh, it's going to be an exciting time, you know. We, we, I just urge us to, 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 to sit down and watch. All right. Uh, you alluded to the fact that uh, people say, uh, people refer to the Ninth Assembly as a rubber stamp assembly. Uh, I'd like to have your thoughts on uh, if you think that this is a fair assessment by people or you think that um, uh, it, 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 it is not fair. Uh, and I would like your broad uh, overview of uh, what, in your opinion, the Knight Assembly achieved. People say that, yes, uh, there were a number of bills, there were more bills, uh, and many of them were quality bills. Uh, the PIA, for example, uh, the uh, Electricity Act, for example, uh, but it, people also say that um, uh, they wasted too much time uh, on other things that were not productive uh, uh, in terms of uh, lawmaking and legislation. And people say that there was more money in terms of budgetary allocation this time around. What would be your um, precise assessment of the Knight Assembly? And will you recommend that or an improvement of that for the 10th Assembly that is about to birth on Tuesday? Well, if, uh, if the, the leadership of APC, the president and the vice president have their way and they get their individuals that they have nominated for the position of the Senate president, deputy Senate president, the speaker and deputy speaker, if they have their way in getting them elected, uh, I don't see a departure from what happened in the night assembly. It's basically going to be the same thing. You know, we might still go with that uh, that name. It might just that name might still remain there as rubber stamp. Rubber stamp. Okay. Well, yeah, saying rubber stamp, I would not say is a fair assessment, but is is it unfair that that was the situation? Because we had bills that went to the president. The president fails to assent to those bills, and then those should have come. That those bills should come back to the house. Or yeah, a certain number of days given. When the president failed to assent to the bills, this is a bill that, I mean, it takes a lot to put a bill together, from gazetting to taking first reading to taking second reading, from sending it to the committee and doing a um, public hearing, and then bringing a the clean copy to the house, or to the floor of the house to do clause by clause consideration, and then doing third reading, and then getting another clean copy, you know, before sending it to the president for accent. After all this work, the president fails to accent to that bill. After 30 days, it should come back to us. Or we should naturally sit and then, you know, override the president. There were a number of bills that the president did not accent to that just died like that. So, if the public called the Night Assembly rubber stamp, that would be one of the reasons. There were, the, there were other issues that... The president would just send instruction, and you would have thought that the House would say, look, we are an arm of government. In the Constitution, we actually, we actually mentioned before the executive. So we control, well, we don't control the post, but we determine what goes to the executive. And with the power of oversight, we can check them, you know? But we didn't do much of that. So, yeah, it's natural to call that house a rubber stamp house. But there were also benefits. There were also benefits because there were things that the leadership wanted and they could sit down with the president and say, we want X, Y, Z, and it was granted, supposedly because of that relationship, you know? And they kept saying this, because of the relationship between the parliament and the executive, we can discuss this with the president and we will, we will get it. Yes, added to the ones you already mentioned, the, the, the PIA, the Electricity Act, then um, even the Electoral Act. Yeah, those were good, good bills that, were, that became acts. But they would definitely need to be amended. Because in the PIA, there was a hurry to make sure it happened. I was a member of that ad hoc committee. There was a lot of work put in there. And at a point, they had even said, even if you, even if you bring a piece of paper 
and write all manner of things on it. The president is ready to assent to it because he's in a hurry to see the PIA happen. And I appreciate the president greatly for that. So, but we did some work, and there are so many things that some of us were against that still went into that act. And in, in practicing, in executing the act, so many other things have come to the fore. So I believe, in short, it's already been amended from, from when it was sent to the president. The president accented to it and brought a list of things that should be amended, that were amended. So, so many other things have come out that should be amended. So as much as we applaud the, the, the National Assembly and the president for assenting to that act, to the, assenting to the bill, we need to amend it like yesterday. Say to the Electoral Act, so many other things have come out also that will need to be amended. Then talking about, um, the other thing we need to, to add will be the, the January to December budgeting cycle, which really I can't call a plus. We are, we, we are hurried to pass the budget. But at the end of the day, their budget is assented to maybe 1st of January. The previous year budget is running to March, other times to June. And I'm sure you are aware the 2022 budget is running side by side the 2023 budget. And we, have a, we extended it to December 2023. So we actually have two budgets running right now. So should we celebrate that? Is that an achievement? For me, there is no much departure from the old ways of getting the budget passed around May or June. So it's just a theory that uh, on paper that, yes, the budget was signed in January. It's going to run from January to December. But in actual practice, it doesn't happen like that. We always have to amend it to extend the life of that budget. So in the last four years, when we claim that we're doing January to December, we always had two budgets running. And that is running, the old one is running to March or is running to June. So would you call that an achievement? I don't think so. Mm. Speaking of, uh, about achievements, I'm going to want to find out what you would want from uh, the 10th National Assembly. But before that, there are reactions that have been trailing uh, the meeting of the elected members of the 10th National Assembly with, uh, from APC uh, with uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, where the ruling party, of course, made its decision known. But there are still people who are unhappy with the selection. Uh, Senator Abdul Aziz Yari, for one, who was absent. And then uh, Senator Oji Uzokalu. Uh, we even saw uh, some video footage of him, you know, expressing himself in tears uh, just a few uh, days ago, saying that they were not consulted, especially uh, looking at that on the back end of the Constitution, which stipulates that the election of the leadership of the National Assembly can only be by the elected members of the Assembly itself. So when you look at, you know, the fact that we're having this meeting and, you know, the President is saying this is who the party has put forward and the the, you know, the elected members knowing that they have the right to vote in who they want. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on this, uh, Honorable Ogun. Yeah, that was, you just quoted section 50, that, you know, is the, the, they have to emerge, the, the presiding officer have to emerge by the election of their colleagues. But that's not to say that the party cannot advise and that's where I think it should end. The party can point them to say, look, this, these gentlemen or ladies have served this party in this category and they have capacity. Ordinarily, if you are going to sell an aqua bill, you will say, okay, he was governor for eight years and he was in the Senate and he left the Senate to serve as a minister. He's coming with such wealth of experience that most people don't have. So we expect that he will be able to manage the executive having been one, and then the parliament also having been one. So for these reasons, we will present Akwabio to you. Beside the fact also that you have a Muslim president, a Muslim vice president, is also a Christian from the South. If you call party members together and tell them this, and say, this is why we think you should go in this direction. That is okay. But to put their names down on the headed people of the party, and you are insisting, and you are, they're almost at the point of, they are cajoling the members now, that this is the direction you must go. 
Otherwise, you'll be sanctioned. That is what we should frown at. Because like I said, these are not children. These are adults, you know, that stood for election, that campaigned, were voted for by their constituents, and were sent here to represent them. So I would think what people should be asking for now is to recall the people they have elected to say, come back to the constituency and brief us. But it's just that we are not there yet in this country. Let's be honest, we are not there yet. That you are given a mandate to come to Abuja to represent the people doesn't mean that you can sit down here and do, go into a wholesale transaction. If the people at home are not happy, they should let you know that they can also recall you. Yeah, even though that is not so easy, the recall might be even in four years' time when you are bidding to come back to the, to the House or to the Senate. So I, I am against the party forcefully projecting people and insisting that their members must vote for them. But what, have even, what about even the opposition? In this case, there's even no opposition. Opposition, ordinarily, they have enough numbers to actually resist the government, the APC. But there's almost no opposition right now. Now, the PDP is talking to their members, but I think it's a little too late, you know, because most of them have taken positions. So who would I be talking about the opposition twatting the effort of, of, the, of the executive? But they are not there. So unfortunately, we might have to live with what they want. And most times, when the executive wants something, they, they, because they have the power of the force, they get their way. And not to talk about these ones, they are politicians. Buhari wasn't really a politician in that sense. You know, he would tell you, again, maybe they would not tell him, please try and meet with them. He would reluctantly go there and meet with them. But these ones who stay awake all night to ensure it happens, they will send a certain number of them to the, to, the, okay. to the parliament on Tuesday to sit down there. And even to, to, to add sort of injury, the, our, order, our, our standing rules have been amended in the House to say that when you are going to vote, you will stand up and call the name of the person you want to vote for. So it's no secret anymore. So if you do that against your party, then your chances of returning might be, might be jeopardized. If you have been promised a committee, if it was a secret ballot, you could go there and do a different thing. But if you promise a committee, you cannot stand up on the floor of the house and then vote against the wishes of the party or the yeah. person that has promised, made that promise to you. So that's why we believe in the house is almost a done deal. Or else something can happen and people will stand and say, look, these are my beliefs. All and right. there are so many people like that okay. that say, look, this is what I believe in and this is what I must do. And I will, you know, I will stand and, 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 uh, and look at and, the party straight and, in the face and whatever okay. consequences that come, I would, I would take it. All right. Honorable Ogun, we want to thank you very much for joining us on the morning show today. Uh, you have been brilliant in your analysis, and we're grateful. Thank you.